This continues our tale of Terran, the assistant pig keeper. Each part will consist of two chapters. The Castle of Lear was written by Lloyd Alexander and published by Henry Holt and Company. I'm glad you stayed to listen. Now sit round as Papa Bear reads a story. Chapter 1 Prince Run Elenwy of the Red Gold Hair, the Princess Elenwy, daughter of Angered, daughter of Regat, of the royal house of Lear, was leaving Caradalban. Dalban himself had so ordered it, and though Terran's heart was suddenly and strangely heavy, he knew there was no gainsaying the old enchanter's words. On the spring morning set for Elenwy's departure, Terran saddled the horses and led them from the stable. The princess, looking desperately cheerful, had wrapped her few belongings in a small bundle slung from her shoulder. At her neck hung a fine chain and crescent moon of silver. On her finger she wore a ring of ancient craftsmanship, and in the fold of her cloak she carried another of her most prized possessions, the golden sphere that shone at her command with a light brighter than a flaming torch. Dalbin, whose face was more careworn than usual, and whose back was bowed as though under a heavy burden, embraced the girl at the cottage door. "'You shall always have a place in care, Dalbin,' he said, "'and a larger one in my heart. But alas, raising a young lady is a mystery beyond even an enchanter's skill. I have had,' he added with a quick smile, "'difficulties enough raising an assistant pig-keeper. I wish you a fair voyage to the Isle of Mona,' Dalbin went on. King Rudlam and Queen Teleria are kindly and gracious. They are eager to stand in your family's stead and serve as your protectors. And from Queen Teleria you shall learn how a princess should behave. What? cried Elmy. I don't care about being a princess. And since I'm already a young lady, how else could I behave? That's like asking a fish to learn how to swim. Hmm. Dalbin said wryly. I have never seen a fish with skinned knees, torn robe, and unshod feet. They would ill become him, as they ill become you. He set a gnarled hand gently on Elenwy's shoulder. Child, child, do you not see? For each of us comes a time when we must be more than what we are. He turned now to Terran. Watch over her carefully, he said. I have certain misgivings about letting you and Gurchy go with her. But if it will ease your parting, so be it. The Princess Elenwy shall go safely to Mona, Taran answered. And you, said Dalbin, return safely. My heart will not be at ease until you do. He embraced the girl again, and went quickly into the cottage. It had been decided that Call would accompany them to Great Avron Harbor, and then lead the horses back. A stout old warrior, already mounted, waited patiently. Shaggy-haired Gurji, astride his pony, looked as mournful as an owl, with a stomach ache. Ka, the tame crow, perched in unwonted silence on Terran's saddle. Terran helped Elenwy mount Luger, her favorite steed, then swung to the back of Melanlas, his silver-maned stallion. Leaving Caerdalbin behind, the little band set out across the soft hills toward Avrin. Side by side, Terran and Kal rode ahead of the others to lead the way. Ka, meanwhile, having made himself comfortable on Terran's shoulder. She never stopped talking for a moment, Terran said gloomily. Now at least it'll be quiet in Caradalban. That it will, said Call. And less to worry about, she was always getting into one scrape or another. That too, said Call. It's for the best, Terran said. Elenwy is, after all, a princess of Lear. It's not as if she were only an assistant pig keeper. Very true said Call, looking off toward the pale hills. They jogged along silently for a while. I shall miss her, Terran burst out at last, half angrily. The old warrior grinned and rubbed his shining bald head. Did you tell her that? Not, not exactly, faltered Terran. I suppose I should have, but every time I began talking about it, I, I felt rather odd. Besides, you never know what silly remark she'll come out with when you're trying to be serious. It may be, replied Call, smiling. We know least what we treasure most. But we will have more than enough to keep us busy when you come back. And you will learn, my boy, there is nothing like work to put the heart at rest. 
Terran nodded sadly. I suppose so, he said. Past midday, they turned their horses to the west, where the hills began a long slope downward into the Avern Valley. At the last ridge, Ka hopped from Terran's shoulder and flapped aloft, croaking with excitement. Terran urged Malamas over the rise. Below, the great river swung into view, wider here than he had ever seen it. Sunlight flecked the water in the sheltered curve of the harbor. A long, slender craft bobbed at the shore. Terran could make out figures aboard, hauling on ropes to raise a square white sail. Elenui and Gurgi had also ridden forward. Terran's heart leapt, and to all the companions, the sight of the harbor and the waiting vessel was like a sea wind driving sorrow before it. Elenui began chattering gaily, and Gurgi waved his arms so wildly he nearly tumbled from the saddle. Yes, oh yes, he cried. Bold, valiant Gurgi is glad to follow kindly master and noble princess with boatings and floatings. They cantered down the slope and dismounted at the water's edge. Seeing them, the sailors ran a plank out from the vessel to the shore. No sooner had they done so than a young man clambered onto the plank and hastened with eager strides toward the companions. But he had only taken a few paces along the swaying board when he lost his footing, stumbled, and with a loud splash, pitched headlong into the shallows. Terran and Call ran to help him, but the young man had already picked himself up and was awkwardly sloshing his way ashore. He was of Terran's age, with a moon-round face, pale blue eyes, and straw-colored hair. He wore a sword and a small, richly ornamental dagger in a belt of silver links. His cloak and jacket, worked with threads of gold and silver, were now sopping wet. The stranger, however, appeared not the least dismayed either by his dunking or the sodden state of his garments. Instead, he grinned as cheerfully as if nothing whatever had befallen him. Hello, hello, he called, waving a dripping hand. Is that Princess Elenui, I see? Of course it must be. Without further ado, and without stopping even to wring out his cloak, he bowed so low that Terran feared the young man would lose his balance. Then he straightened up, and in a solemn voice declared, on behalf of Rudlam, son of Rudd, and Teleria, daughter of Tanwin, king and queen of the Isle of Mona, greetings to the Princess Eleni of the Royal House of Lear, and to... well, to the rest of all of you as well, he added, blinking rapidly as a thought suddenly occurred to him. I should have asked your names before I started. Terran, taken aback and not a little vexed by this scatterbrained behavior, stepped forward and presented the companions. Before he could ask the stranger's name, the young man interrupted. Splendid! You must all introduce yourselves again later, one at a time, otherwise I might forget. Ah, I see the ship's master waving at us, something to do with the tides, no doubt. He's always very concerned with them. This is the first time I've commanded a voyage, he went on proudly. Amazing how easy it is. All you need to do is tell the sailors. But who are you? Terran asked, puzzled. The young man blinked at him. Did I forget to mention that? I'm Prince Run. Prince Run, Terran repeated in a tone of disbelief. Quite so, I'm afraid, answered Run, smiling pleasantly. King Rudlum's my father, and of course Queen Teleria's my mother. Shall we go aboard? I should hate to upset the shipmaster, for he does worry about those tides. Call embraced Eleni. When we see you again, he told her, I doubt we shall recognize you. You shall be a fine princess. But I want to be recognized, Elenry cried. I want to be me. Never fear, said Call, winking. He turned to Terran. And you, my boy, farewell. When you return, send Ka ahead to tell me, and I shall meet you at Avern Harbor. Prince Run, offering his arm to Elenry, led her across the plank. Gurgi and Terran followed them. Having formed his own opinion of Run's agility, Terran kept a wary eye on the prince until Elenui was safe aboard. The ship was surprisingly roomy and well-fitted. The deck was long, with benches for oarsmen on either side. At the stern rose a high, square shed, topped by a platform. The sailors dipped their oars and worked the vessel to the middle of the river. Call trotted along the bank and waved with all his might. The old warrior dropped from sight as the ship swung around a bend in the ever-widening river. Ka had flapped the masthead, and, as the breeze whistled through his feathers, he beat his wings so pridefully that he looked more like a black rooster than a crow. The shore turned gray in the distance, and the craft sped seaward. 
If Run had perplexed and vaguely irritated him at their first meeting, Terran now began to wish he had never laid eyes on the prince. Terran had meant to speak with Elony apart, for there was much in his heart he longed to tell her. Yet each time he ventured to do so, Prince Run would pop up as if from nowhere, his round face beaming happily, calling out, Hello, hello! A greeting Terran found more infuriating each time he heard it. Once the Prince of Mona eagerly dashed up to show the companions a large fish he had caught, to the delight of Elanui and Gurji, but not Terran. For a moment later, Run's attention turned elsewhere, and he'd hurried off, leaving Terran holding the wet, slippery fish in his arms. Another time, while leaning over the side to point out a school of dolphins, the prince nearly dropped his sword into the sea. Luckily, Terran caught it before the blade was lost forever. After the ship reached open water, Prince Run decided to take a hand at steering, but he no sooner grasped the tiller but he no sooner grasped the tiller than it flew out of his fingers. While Run clutched at the wooden handle, the vessel lurched and slewed about so violently that Terran was flung against the bulwark. A water cask broke loose and went rolling down the deck. The sail flapped madly at the sudden change of course, and one bag of oars nearly snapped before the steersman regained the tiller from the undismayed prince. The painful bump on Terran's head did nothing to raise his esteem of Prince Run's seamanship. Although the prince made no further attempt to steer the vessel, he climbed atop the platform where he called out orders to the crew. Lash the sail, Run shouted happily. Steady the helm! No seaman himself, Terran nevertheless realized the sail was already tightly lashed, and the craft was moving unwaveringly through the water, and he very shortly became aware that the sailors were quietly going about their task of keeping the ship on course, without paying any heed whatever to the prince. Terran's head ached from the bump, and his jacket was still unpleasantly damp and fishy. And when at last his chance came to speak with Elanui, he was altogether out of sorts. Prince of Moda, indeed, he muttered. He's no more than a princeling, a clumsy, muddle-headed baby commanding the voyage. If the sailors listened to him, we'd be aground in no time. I've never sailed a ship, but I have no doubt I could do better than he. I've never seen anyone so feckless. Feckless, answered Elanui. He does often seem a little dense, but I'm sure he means well, and I've a feeling he has a good heart. In fact, I think he's rather nice. I suppose you would, Terran replied, all the more nettled by Eleni's words, because he gave you his arm to lean on, a gallant, princely gesture. Lucky he didn't pitch you over the side. It was polite, at least, Eleni remarked, which is something assistant pig-keepers sometimes aren't. An assistant pig-keeper, Terran snapped. Yes, that's to be my lot in life. I was born to be one, just as the princeling of Mona was born to his rank. He's a king's son, and I... I don't even know the names of my parents. Well, said Elanui, you can't blame Run for being born. I mean, you could, but it wouldn't help matters. It's like kicking a rock with your bare foot. Terran snorted. I dare say that's his father's sword he's got on, and I dare say he's never drawn it except to frighten a rabbit. At least I've earned the right to wear mine. Yet he still calls himself a prince. Does his birth make him worthy of his rank? As worthy as Gwydion, son of Dawn? Prince Gwydion's the greatest warrior in Prydain, Ellen replied. You can't expect everyone to be like him. And it seems to me that if an assistant pigkeeper does the best he can, and a prince does the best he can, there's no difference between them. No difference, Terran cried angrily. You spoke well enough of Run. Terran of Caird Dalman, Ellen declared. I really believe you're jealous and sorry for yourself, and that's as ridiculous as... as... painting your nose green. Terran said no more, but turned away and stared glumly at the water. To make matters worse, the wind freshened, and the sea heaved about the sides of the ship, and Terran could barely keep his footing. His head spun, and he feared the vessel would capsize. Elanui, deathly pale, clung to the bulwark. Gurgi wailed and howled pitifully. Poor Tenderhead is full of whirlings and twirlings. Gurji does not like this ship anymore. He wants to be at home. Prince Run appeared not the least distressed. He ate heartily and was in the best of spirits, while Terran huddled wretchedly in his cloak. The sea did not calm until dusk, and at nightfall Terran was grateful the vessel anchored in a calm cove. Helenry took out the golden sphere. In her hands it began to glow, and its rays shimmered over the black water. I say, what's that? cried Prince Run, who had clambered down from his platform. It's my bauble, said Eleni. I always carry it with me. 
You can never tell when it will come in handy. Amazing, exclaimed the prince. I've never seen anything like it in my life. He examined the golden ball carefully, but as he held it in his hand, the light winked out. Run looked up in dismay. I'm afraid I've broken it. No, no, Eleni assured him. It's just that it doesn't work for everyone. Unbelievable, said Run. You must show it to my parents. I wish we had a few of those trinkets around the castle. After a last curious glance at the bauble, Run returned it to Eleni, insisting that the princess sleep in the comfort of the shed. Run bedded himself down amid a pile of netting. Gurji curled up nearby, while Ka, heedless of Terran's entreaties to leave his high perch, roosted on the mast. Run, falling asleep instantly, snored so piercingly that Terran, already vexed beyond endurance, stretched out on the deck as far as possible from the slumbering prince. When Terran slept at last, he dreamed the companions had never left Cairdalban. Chapter 2 Dinus Ridnant. The days that followed put Terran in better spirits. The companions grew used to the motion of the ship. The air was clear, sharp, and salt-laden, and Terran could taste the briny spray on his lips, while Prince Run from atop his platform shouted commands which the crew, as usual, did not heed. The companions were glad to pass the time by lending a hand to the tasks aboard. The work as Call had foretold eased Terran's heart. Yet there came moments when he suddenly recalled the purpose of the voyage, and wished that it would never end. He had just finished coiling a length of rope when Ka swooped down from the mast and circled around him, croaking wildly. An instant later, the lookout cried he had sighted land. At Prince Run's urging, the companions hastened to climb to the platform. In the bright morning, Terran saw the hills of Mona spring from the horizon. The vessel sped closer to the crescent-shaped harbor of Dinus Ridnant, with its piers and jetties, its stone seawall and clusters of ships. Steep cliffs rose almost from the water's edge, and on the highest of them stood a tall castle. From it, the banners of the House of Rudlam snapped in the breeze. The vessel glided to the pier. The sailors cast the mooring lines and leaped ashore. The companions, with Prince Run marching in the lead, were escorted to the castle by ranks of warriors who made a hedge of honor with their spears. Yet even did, yet even this short journey did not end without mishap. The Prince of Mona, drawing his sword to return the salute of the Captain of Guards, Captain of the Guards, did so with such a sweeping gesture that the point snagged in Terran's cloak. I say, I'm sorry about that, cried Run, curiously examining the long, gaping slash his blade had caused. And I too, Prince of Mona, Terran muttered, vexed at Run, and embarrassed at the impression his torn garment would make on the king and queen. He said no more, but shut his lips, and desperately hoped the damage would go unnoticed. The procession passed through the castle gates and into a wide courtyard. Shouting a glad, Hello, hello! Prince Run hurried to his waiting parents. King Rudlum had the same round and cheerful face as Prince Run. He greeted the companions cordially, repeating himself a number of times. If he was aware of Terran's clo torn cloak, he showed no sign, which only added to Terran's distress. When King Rudlum at last finished talking, Queen Talira stepped forward. The queen was a stout, pleasant-looking woman, dressed in fluttering white garments. A golden circlet crowned her braided hair, which was the same straw color as Prince Run's. She showered Elenwy with kisses, embraced the still-embarrassed Terran, halted in amazement when she came to Gurji, but embraced him too, nevertheless. "'Welcome, daughter of Angered,' Queen Talira began, returning to Elenwy. Your presence honors, don't fidget, child, and stand straight, our royal house. The queen stopped suddenly and took Eleni by the shoulders. Good lear, she cried. Where did you get those frightful clothes? Yes, I see it's high time Dolben let you out of that hole-end corner in the middle of the woods. Hole-end corner, indeed, Eleni cried. I love care, Dolben, and Dolben is a great enchanter. Exactly, said Queen Talira. He's so busy casting spells and all such that he's let you grow like a weed. She turned to King Rudlam. Wouldn't you say so, my dear? <clears throat> yes, very much like a weed, agreed the king, eyeing Ka with interest. The crow hunched up his wings, opened his beak, and loudly croaked, Rudlam! to the king's immense delight. Queen Teleria, meanwhile, had been examining Terran and Gurji by turns. Look at that disgracefully torn cloak. You must both have new raiment immediately, she declared. 
No jackets, no sandals, everything. Luckily, we have a perfectly wonderful shoemaker at the castle now. He was just, don't pout that way, my child, you'll give yourself a blister, passing through. But we've kept him busy, and he's still cobbling away. Our chief steward shall see to it. Mag? she called. Mag, where is he? At your command, answered the chief steward, who had been standing all the while by Queen Teleria's elbow. He wore one of the finest cloaks Terran had ever seen, its rich embroidery almost surpassing King Rudlam's garment. Mag carried a long staff of polished wood taller than himself. From, from his neck hung a chain of heavy silver links, and at his belt was a huge iron ring from which jingled keys of all sizes. All has been ordered, said Mag, bowing deeply. Your decision has been foreseen. The shoemaker, the tailors, and the weavers stand ready. Excellent, Queen Tleary cried. Now the princess and I shall go first to the weaving rooms, and Mag shall show the rest of you to your chambers. Mag bowed again, even more deeply, and beckoned with his staff. With Gurgi at his heels, Terran followed the chief steward through the courtyard into a high stone building and down a vaulted corridor. At the end of it, Mag gestured toward an open portal and silently withdrew. Terran stepped inside. The chamber was small. The chamber was small, but neat and airy, bright with sunlight from a narrow casement. Fragrant rushes covered the floor, and in one corner stood a low couch and a pallet of straw. Terran had no sooner taken off his cloak when the portal suddenly burst open and a spiky yellow head thrust in. Fluter flam! Terran shouted with joyful surprise at the sight of this long-absent companion. Well met! The bard seized Terran by the hand and began pumping it with all his might, at the same time clapping him resoundingly on the shoulder. Ka flapped his wings, while Gurji leapt into the air, yelped at the top of his voice, and embraced Fluter in a shower of twigs, leaves, and shedding hair. Well, 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 said the bard, and high time it is. I've been waiting for you. I thought I'd never get here. I thought you'd never get here. How did you come? cried Terran, who had just begun to catch his breath. How did you know we were to be at Dinus Ridnaunt? Well, I, I couldn't help knowing, the bard replied, beaming with delight. There's been talk of nothing but the Princess Elenry. Where is she, by the way? I must find her and pay my respects at once. I was hoping Dolbin would send her along with you. How is she? How is he? How is Call? I see you've brought Call. Great Beelin, I've seen none of you for so long I've lost track. But, Fluter, Terran interrupted, what brings you to Mona of all places? Well, it's a short tale, said the bard. I had decided this time really to make a go of becoming, of being a king, and so I did, for the best part of a year. Then along came spring, and the barding and wandering season, and everything indoors began looking unspeakably dreary, and everything outdoors began looking somehow clearer, brighter, and began somehow pulling at me, and the next thing I knew I was on my way. I'd never been to Mona, so that was the best reason in the world for going. I reached Dinus Ridnaunt a week ago. The vessel had already left to meet you, or you could be sure I'd have been on it. And you can be sure that you'd have borne us better company than the princeling of Mona, Terran said. We were lucky that noble fool didn't somehow manage to blunder onto a reef and sink us in the tide. But what of Dolly? he went on. I have longed to see him as much as I have longed to see you. <laughs> Good old Dolly, the bard chuckled, shaking his yellow head. I tried to rouse him when I first set out, but he's hidden himself away with his kinsmen in the realm of the fair folk. Fluter sighed. I fear a good dwarf has lost his taste for adventure. I managed to get word to him, thinking he might come along with me for the sport of it. He sent back a message. All it said was, Humph! You should have come to meet us at the harbor, Terran said. It would have cheered me to know you were here. Yes, ah, I was going to, replied Fluter with some hesitation. But I thought I'd wait and surprise you. I was busy, too, getting ready for a song about the arrival of the princess. Quite an impressive chant, if I do say so myself. We're all mentioned in it, with plenty of heroic deeds. And Gurji too? cried Gurji. But of course, said the bard, I shall sing it for all of you this evening. Gurji shouted and clapped his hands. Gurji cannot wait to hear strummings and hummings. You shall hear them, old friend, the bard assured him. All in due course, but you can imagine I can hardly spare the time to join the welcoming procession. At this, a harp string broke suddenly. Fluter unslung his beloved instrument and looked at it ruefully. There it goes again, he sighed. These beastly strings will never leave off snapping whenever I, uh, add a little to the truth. And in this case, the truth of the matter is, 
I wasn't invited. But a bard of the harp is honored at every court in Prydane, Taryn said. How could they overlook? Fluter raised a hand. True, true, he said. I was certainly honored here, and handsomely too. That was before they learned I wasn't a real bard. Afterward, he admitted, I was moved into the stables. You should have told them you were a king, said Taryn. No, 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 said Fluter, shaking his head. When I'm a bard, I'm a bard, and when I'm a king, that's something else again. I never mix the two. King Rudlam and Queen Teleria are decent sorts, Fluter continued. The chief steward was the one who had me turned out. Are you sure there wasn't some mistake? Taryn asked. From what I've seen him, he seems to do his duties perfectly. All too well, if you ask me, said Fluter. Somehow he found out about my qualifications, and the next thing I knew, into the stables. The truth of it is, I think he hates music. Surprising how many people I've run into who, for some reason or other, simply can't abide harp playing. Taryn heard a loud rapping at the portal. It was Mag himself, come with the shoemaker, who stood humbly behind him. Not that he troubles me, Fluter whispered. That is, he added, looking at his harp, not beyond what I can honorably bear. He slung the instrument over his shoulder. Yes, well, as I was saying, I must go and find the Princess Elemy. We shall meet later, in the stables, if you don't mind, and I shall play my new song. Glaring at Mag, Fluter strode from the chamber. The chief steward, taking no notice of the bard's angry glance, bowed to Terran. As Queen Teleria commanded, you and your companion are to be given new apparel. The shoemaker will serve you as you wish. Terran sat down on a wooden stool, and, as Mag departed from the chamber, the shoemaker drew near. The man was bent with age and garbed most shabbily. A grimy cloth was wrapped around his head, and a fringe of gray hair fell almost to his shoulders. At his broad belt hung curiously shaped knives, awls, and hanks of thongs. Kneeling before Terran, he opened a great sack and thrust in his hand to pull out strips of leather, which he placed about him on the floor. He squinted at his findings, holding up one after the other, then casting it aside. We must use the best, the best, he croaked in a voice much like cause. Only that will do. To go well shod is half the journey, he chuckled. Is that not so, eh? Is that not so? Terran of Cairdolban. Terran drew back with a start. The shoemaker's tone had suddenly rung differently. He stared down at the aged man who had picked up a piece of leather and was now shaping it deftly with a crooked little knife. The shoemaker, his face as tanned as his own materials, was watching him steadily. Gurji looked ready to yelp loudly. The man raised his finger to his lips. Terran, in confusion, hurriedly knelt before the shoemaker. Lord Gwydion! Gwydion's eyes flashed with pleasure, but his smile was grim. Hear me well, he said quickly, in a hushed voice. Should we be interrupted, I shall find a way to speak with you later. Tell no one who I am. What you must know, above all, is this. The life of Princess Elemy is in danger. And so, he added, is your own. Thank you for listening. And remember, have a good day. You deserve it.